Have you had fun in this conference? Yeah. Some nodding heads, yeah. I, I did, and I, I loved the Lina's presentation. It cal calmed me down. I, I, I've done a few of these myself, and uh, I usually get nervous. Uh, but the uh, presentation like Lina's helped me get my zen on. So I'm, <laughs> I'm only all in the zone now. Uh, but yeah. Um, Let's start with a history lesson. Information technology evolution, or history, whatever. Uh, according to some theories, it started all the way back to the 1800s with the Jacquard loom. It was this machine that had these punch cards uh, fed into the system, and the, the machine created uh, intricate patterns of fabric. So that was actually programming the machine to create a frap. Uh, then, quite a bit of fast forward in to the 70s, 60s and 70s, the mainframes came. And uh, yeah, you might even work with some of them today. Even, even we have a code that is 30, 40 years old. And we have to <laughs> maintain that. Uh, yeah, a bit dramatic. Every project lasted long years, spent millions of uh, dollars or euros as we have in Europe. Uh, and uh, yeah, a bit dramatic uh, piece of uh, equipment. And then the uh, technology got a li little bit smaller. Uh, 90s and the client server architecture and even smaller in the 2000s when everything moved into cloud and so on. So technologies became uh, commoditized. So we, instead of uh, us serving technology, it started serving us. And now we are here. So uh, Tanya showed the purity periodic table of DevOps tools yesterday. This is a current version made by Cloud Native Computing Foundation. There's almost 700 tools that you can use to build Cloud Native uh, software. And the uh, numbers are rising. You have more and more tools and you can uh, do pretty much anything with them. You can create chatbots. Uh, you, can, you can have service proxies. You have you can have uh, chaos engineering. What you what not? So uh, that leads to an obvious conclusion. Technologies, individual technologies, their value approaches zero. So they they are becoming mayflies. They have short life cycles. Projects are lasting shorter and shorter. So. What should we do? Because usually when we go to DevOps conference, there's uh, 41 tracks, uh, 41 speeches there, and 40 uh, speak about tools <laughs> that become obsolete in a moment. So is that sensible? We might have to concentrate on something else too. Uh, we are not going to. Uh, handle everything today that we do in DevOps, but something. Uh, but before we get into that, something about myself. Uh, yeah, I do nowadays. I've done training quite a bit and coaching work, and I, I worked at ELISA nowadays, and also my uh, own consultancy, consultancy company called Happy Monkey which I consider myself. <laughs> and uh, in uh, ELISA, we actually, with Finns, we use most uh, mobile data in the world per capita. So a lot of data is going to ELISA, which is the biggest telecom company in Finland. We do uh, a lot of uh, cooperation with uh, Vodafone and uh, all the international players, Ericsson, Huawei, so on. And uh, yeah, I try to help people with their testing and DevOps challenges in Alice. Uh, 
among other things, I'm a Finn, as in I live in Finland. Uh, other than being uh, these northern trolls that live in <laughs> darkness and uh, drink, drink huge amounts of alcohol, <laughs> we are considered uh, to be one of the happiest nations in the world. I don't know why that is. But <laughs> <laughs> but often when, we, when they measure happiness of nations, they, they consider Finland to be the top of the list all the time. Uh, well, we have saunas. <laughs> saunas are awesome. I, I go to sauna almost every day. That makes me happy. Yeah, beer and so on. Um, and uh, we have Santa Claus. Don't argue with me that, on that. <laughs> Because I, I know that you, some of you think that Santa Claus uh, lives in the North Pole, but it actually lives in Finland. <laughs> Trust me on this. <laughs> and that fact makes me happy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and also uh, we have the most uh, heavy band per capita in the world. And look at those happy guys. <laughs> does, does, does that, doesn't that fill your heart with joy? Image. So, this is us, yeah. No, no. This is a band called Horna, which means hell. <laughs> and they are, they, they are quite uh, something in the live show. But yeah, that's short about me. Let's into, get into today's menu. Uh, first, we look into how to team up around DevOps, how to build teams that can build it, that can carry the load of DevOps on their shoulders. And one mysterious place in, um, in all of this is the design process, service design, and all the fine people in there, how we can help them and connect quality into that process. And some breaking illusions, uh, some experiences on mine on that, and also breaking your illusions today. And Scaling up from team level to organization level, even enterprise level. Okay. Yes, thank you for sharing uh, Katrina's. I, I say good things about Katrina wherever I can. She's a tester in New Zealand. Well, quite a bit more than the tester. She does awesome stuff and also has written this book, Testing and DevOps. Uh, well encapsulates the uh, DevOps, what it is. Uh, okay, in the center of the universe is testing. If you see into a, an atom, you see a face of, uh, for instance, Eddie in the back row or something, or Lena. <laughs> tester is the, for me, tester is the most important person in the world. Uh, if you work in a waterfall model, you have these silos people. You have testing, coding, business people, management, and design. And uh, these uh, interactions between these, handovers, uh, toll gates, whatever, they create latency. So the projects get bigger and bigger. And usually the waterfall projects last like one year or two years or so. Uh, when we move to agile world, you have this dark matter joining everyone to a team and everything becomes team responsibility. Team can carry these uh, responsibilities. So there are no special testers. We, we, for instance, in Elisa, we don't have actually testers. We know we have people who can test, even developers and so on. Uh, and then you start, even the business responsibilities are within a team. When you move to DevOps, you have more, more responsibilities, more on the production side, operation side, and so on. For instance, uh, have you had to ever gather people do, who do support? Have you done support in your life? Yes. So that when I joined Elisa, my first job was to build a support team. Uh, it's not hard to, it's not easy to find people who can work in three shifts 
and uh, answer all kinds of nonsense that comes from a customer. What's my password? Even though you should develop uh, smart networks to help heal themselves. <coughs> that's, uh, and still, that's a team responsibility. So that may lead to a situation where DevOps, people in DevOps teams don't work, want to work in those teams anymore. They have to opt to the bird. So it's a, there's a lot of, uh, you have to wear silky gloves when uh, you are building teams like these because there's a lot of responsibilities that people don't want to do. But still, if you want to carry the load of DevOps, this is something you should aim for. But read more about Catherine's book. Uh, and then, there's not one way to do DevOps teams. There's ways to organize yourself around that concept. Uh, if you go to that kind of uh, address, you see a few patterns and also anti-patterns on how to make DevOps teams. For instance, I uh, recently ran a business that sold Ops business, Ops Cloud, uh, Red Hat OpenShift to customers. And then we had a team that worked in close collaboration with the customer development teams and helped them to work on that platform. And that was just one. You have, can have site reliability engineers in there. You, have, you can have database people and so on. So all kinds of ways to organize on that. Uh, then, does anyone know this guy called Dan Ashby? <laughs> yeah. He has brilliant ideas on how to de test around DevOps. It, it doesn't, uh, any point you can test. Actually. You can test uh, the ideas, you can test the actual code, you can test the packaging, you can test actual containers. And do, when you are moving smaller and smaller increments, you can test like unikernels or smart dust, whatever. And you can package uh, them into pipelines platforms and so on, you can test those. You can test uh, pretty much everything. But there's a lot of uh, things going on around that. And you have an idea. For instance, if you take the three amigos approach, then you gather uh, business people, development people, and testing people, and start wondering how on different perspectives we can prevent that from happening whether it's a PR approach, whether it's a technical approach, and so on. So you can, you can build from that. Uh, but what it means in practice, you cannot just throw in ideas because you can, you can start uh, building a load over people that they cannot necessarily carry. So you should build some kind of a pipeline other than the CI-CD pipeline. And my most successful approach on that has been tapping into the service design. Uh, does anyone know about the double diamonds technique? On that? No, no hands so. up. Uh, double diamonds is a uh, uh, way to get from idea to reality or from a problem to a solution or so on. So. Uh, what it basically means that you have these four stages. At first, you discover all the options for the what to build. Building the right thing is the first diamond. And uh, you start uh, including everything uh, from uh, customer research, telemetry. You can start uh, bringing in quality dimensions. Where should we? Uh, should we take care of uh, performance, security, and so on? You can start throwing ideas to the discover. It expands, the amount of options expand, and then you start to focus on what you will build. And then in the latter, you start uh, wondering about how we should make this idea into reality. 
you start to map the options. For instance, the wide variety of uh, DevOps tools you can use. And what from those tools you, you will use. Do you settle for Docker Swarm? Or do you go to Kubernetes? Or do you go further into Helm? Or what, what are you doing? So you focus on what you are doing and how you're doing. And it becomes reality. Still a bit vague. What should we fill in in this pipeline? One of the most successful approaches has been consistency heuristics by Michael Bolton. Do you know this guy? Yeah. Uh, sorry? What? God damn it. <laughs> well, sorry. I need to. I have to make another build. <laughs> oh, thanks for noticing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, that's Mike Bolton. Uh, he has came up with the uh, this idea of uh, consistency heuristics. Now, certain focus points you can introduce to service design people. For instance, company image. Would it be consistent with the uh, Apple image if it started releasing these uh, clamshell phones that were big hit uh, in the beginning of uh, 2000? Would it be consistent on that? Uh, this is often good driving, uh, driving prioritizing focus point. Uh, when you make a claim, for instance, to a press, that you will be like this, your product will be like this. Everything will focus on that. All the development and everything. You make sure that it will be like the claim that was done to a press. It will be consistent with that. And there's a lot of, when you Google few hiccups, then you can get deeper into that. Consistency heuristics. But that's only one, one approach. Uh, you can uh, input, for instance, uh, product dimensions. You can introduce those to, to service design people. Uh, what kind of functions we are after. Integrations. Uh, do we have any relation on time? Uh, do you have any constraints? And uh, how will people use it? And all those kinds of uh, stuff. Uh, then they started to uh, start uh, visualizing that. And as designers do, they, they can, because they often they have quite, quite wild ideas, as at least my designers do. And they, they don't have any focus points on that, their work. So when you, as a quality worker, when you introduce these kind of uh, heuristics, then you can start directing their work. And that's, well, commotion going on on shift left. That's what it actually means for me, working with uh, design people. And when it hits uh, development and the DevOps loop, then it's uh, in better shape. You are, uh, have better focus on things. And uh, yeah, you consider all this and more. I have actually this uh, heuristic test strategy model with uh, over 3,000 of these in it. So it's a bit of an overkill. So I, I need to work on that, how to focus on that. So my uh, first option spreading is uh, quite huge. And uh, no one will listen to that. But uh, when we use double diamond, it's a common language with the designers and business and so on. It's not an important tool as itself, but it will tie every, all this into their work and they will listen to you. But yeah, talking about mind maps. Uh, there has been quite 
quite a few testing exercises and talking about actual testing. So let's test a bit. You have a product or computer. It has a uh, power source and it has a requirement on that. How would you test this in requirement? This is actually, I've uh, interviewed a lot of people in the testing and quality pushes and also in development. And uh, this is a challenge I often throw at, it, at them. So this is like a big job interview. So what would we do with this one? This requirement. Boundary. Boundary. Are you a classically trained uh, tester? Like uh, you have ISTQB or TMAP or, but you know about those. Yeah, yeah you know to, about techniques. That's, yeah. a, that's a basic technique, yeah. Boundary values. Any other approaches? That's a, yeah, that's a going a bit further, but yeah. But yeah, you are starting to get into heuristics. But the algorithmic approach that you took would suggest something like equivalence classes and boundary value analysis. Why have I divided into dummy and smart test? Eddie? Sorry? Yes. Those are actual currents used mostly in the world. And uh, there's also this uh, pass and fail conundrum. Did anyone concentrate on the nominal range? Does anyone know what it means when we are talking about uh, currents? It means uh, you can allow variance. Or was it uh, plus minus five VAC? So what it does to boundary value analysis? Where do you set the boundaries then? Because it should work with 99 actual device, if that's the uh, requirement. And this is my favorite bit. If you set some test to pass, does it mean that, for instance, I couldn't get it to fail? This will keep you up at night, this question. Because I will make my life's mission to make it red. I will do anything to break it. Well, I'm not going to break it. I'm bringing visibility on its flaws. So, every time I see green, green is my absolute, it's the worst color in the world. When I see a row of green in Jenkins, I start kicking the servers and uh, hacking and do whatever. I bite the machines, <laughs> like the northern troll I am. <laughs> but yeah, this, when you uh, create polarity, when you reduce testing to a pass and fail, this is what you get. It doesn't necessarily mean quality. But, yeah, before moving on, uh, automated suits and the, the kind are often like this. You are going after something, yeah, a bit big. This is from Gary Larson's The Far Side comic, it's a classic humor. Uh, but yeah, to me it's often like this. You are chasing after something quite big and unreasonably big. Be human about it. Ask questions. If you are a QA, you are not quality assurance, you are a question asker. So, you could ask 
uh, about the requirement itself. Uh, did anyone know what VAC mean, meant? About the nominal, about the, it's a alternating current, so it goes like a sine wave. There's also the con constant, and uh, how about amps? Who will use it? And uh, do we have anyone who knows anything about electronics? <laughs> are we just killing ourselves testing the thing? These are the things that you should ask when you are approaching that kind of uh, challenge. And it doesn't uh, change when you're working in DevOps, when you're releasing, you have zero day deliveries. So they are still there. You question, if not the product itself, you question the process, you question uh, requirements, uh, design, so on. You question the audio system in the presentation room. I was actually looking, after the accident happened, I started looking for uh, self pens so that I can start drawing on this slide. So yeah, question everything. And that's, that leads to uh, breaking illusions. Because all these uh, equivalence classes, even though they are good uh, to create automation sets and so on, uh, these kind of questions break the illusions about the product and the quality and so on. So focus on that, even though you are moving quite fast enough. Uh, then? when you move to uh, enterprise context. You should, uh, how would you bring it to the whole company? This is the best approach. I have had tons of, uh, for instance, I did uh, maturity matrices and I've done interviews and whatever. I've tried helping people in different ways, but this is the best way I can expand uh, DevOps, testing, and whatever our approach to the organization. Uh, when you have a team that does brilliant results as a team level, uh, gather those references and uh, start shouting about it. Now, some teams that, uh, for instance, uh, Puppet Labs have uh, gathered these uh, research resources about uh, high-performing teams that they can create like uh, 3,000 times the throughput that the low-performing team. We haven't been there yet, but uh, we can chase those values and uh, something that resonates with the people who make decisions. So if the team is doing something, they are releasing really fast in the production uh, or the they downtime is really low or what not, these values that are uh, these things that are valuable to the uh, people who run the business. And make it visible to everyone. Shout louder than the people who are, who are talking about nonsense. Because there's a lot of those also in companies. And then you wait. And uh, there's this magic happening you suddenly have a market. The decision makers, they start believing in you, if you are convincing enough, and they will start making the work for you. They start demanding that from other teams, and you have a market for your consulting work, and uh, yeah, you basically start helping people into getting to the, to the par with these internal teams. That's uh, okay, it sounds simpler than it is, but if you get decision making on board, they will do the work for you, scaling up the approach. Uh, we have now, when you have a market, you have to have something to offer also. Not just, I run, of course, exploratory testing clinics and so on. I can uh, educate 20 people out of, at a time. But uh, we have a big organization, so we need more. So we are currently implementing this uh, continuous unconference concept where we gather everyone willing to share 
and they they will uh, be in bi-weekly, for instance, in a room, and uh, they have a topic that they will share with the rest of the company, and we have a shared calendar. You can you can see from a calendar that Summit is sitting in the Thursday's afternoon in this room telling about exploratory test. So people will show there. First, there's only one or two people, but suddenly, if the topic is interesting enough, it, they are always filled. For instance, uh, people uh, training Jenkins, they are always filled, Ansible filled, and so on. So you have also uh, feedback on whether your knowledge is relevant. So, And also, I, I've been working in a company well, where they had belt gradings. Uh, you get yellow belt in heuristic testing when you find five bugs using five different heuristics. Then uh, orange belt, uh, you use 25 different you find 25 bugs using 25 different heuristics, and so on. And uh, in a black belt, it goes closer to 1,000 bugs using 1,000 different heuristics. So set the challenge proper. So that's something we will also try. But perhaps next year I will have some results. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Here is one approach that uh, management often asks, maturity model. Here are different focus points that have worked in a certain context, but I had to change a few bit, bits. So these are basically, if you want to improve architecture in DevOps, you start going for these goals, step at, one step at a time. But they might not work in every context. So, don't take any pictures from that. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is just one, one context. But uh, it gives the idea of uh, how to create like visible goals to whole organization. But it's really difficult because teams have different needs and their business have different needs and so on. So, but to a certain point, this works. But be careful with this kind of stuff. Uh, this is something I like way more. It uh, shows the value base. What kind of values are you chasing? You, someone talked about anti-fragile yesterday. I wasn't in that, but that's a really dear topic on, of mine. Uh, being the opposite of fragile, uh, improving from uh, adversities. So we are currently building this, uh, we have this group called Elisa Automate that creates solutions for uh, telecom networks to start healing themselves based on the information they get from the field. So there's no human interaction on that because everything happens quite fast. You can imagine, for instance, uh, uploading a config configuration update that affects the whole network. You cannot test that ever. But there's also this machine learning algorithms there. And we are currently selling it to, I don't know if we are selling it to US market, but we are selling it to European market. So heads up if you heard about Elisa Automate. But yeah, that's the value base we are chasing. And that's way beyond any tooling or technologies. And, uh, but this is just, uh, sketch we made with my friends. It may improve, but it shows that we aim for the uh, right side goal. Uh, now, the meat around the bones. Questions, answers, and one thing that makes Finnish people happy is salmiakki. Have you tasted this? How do you like it? <laughs> I've, I've made a lot of enemies feeding these to people. <laughs> so, ask me a question and get salmiak.